Welcome to Waterside Chat. Tom Sadler talks with guests who depend on healthy oceans and fisheries for their recreation and livelihoods. And now, let's get started. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Tom Sadler, the host of today's Marine Fish Conservation Network's Waterside Chat. Um, I'm delighted to welcome my good friend, Joel Johnson. Joel is the president and CEO of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. And this afternoon, we'll be talking a little bit about what's new at the Marine uh, National Marine Sanctuary Foundation now that Joel's taken the helm, um, what his plans are for the coming year or more on, uh, we hope, which will be a long tenure uh, at the foundation, uh, what his plans are, and then some uh, updates on sanctuary designations and other such stuff. So, Joel, welcome. Thank you, Tom. Well, I'm delighted to have you. Um, I'd love to, uh, for for most people don't know you like I do. So um, I think the last time you and I, or the first time you and I saw each other was out in Colorado with um, Johnny LaCoke's ranch talking about water issues. And we've stayed in touch and stayed involved in water issues. And now you are uh, right in the thick of it, as am I, in water issues. But let's talk a little bit about who Joel Johnson is. So give us the Joel Johnson backstory. Sure, sure. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm delighted, honored to be here. Um, for My name is Joel Johnson, and I have um, been in the conservation space now for going on, oh, I don't know, 10, oh, 10, 10 or so years. Um, but uh, I have a background in corporate communications and storytelling, and uh, how I found my way into the conservation space was recognizing the need to uh, turn those persuasive skills around uh, in a very meaningful way to help the planet. You know, uh, I think like a lot of folks, they kind of, you know, you get to a point where you um, have a kind of an awakening about the need uh, mm -hmm. for um, both personally and professionally to make your contribution. I hit mine. And uh, fortunately, where I found myself was in conservation and where we met, Tom, was actually at a Trout Unlimited retreat where we were having some of those deep existential thoughts over some beers and fishing um, as we were attempting to think about uh, large scale planning and conservation for trout uh, cool. and other salmon species when I was the chief communications and marketing officer there. It must have been like 2012, 2011, somewhere, somewhere in that, somewhere in that time frame. Uh, so the journey for me uh, in the last few years, uh, after the uh, trout, my time at Trout Unlimited, uh, I opened a firm in Washington D.C. where we actually had some conservation clients. So I was very fortunate. To Which has with. one of the great names of a conservation. I mean, <laughs> as a PR firm. So yeah. don't forget to mention what the name was. That's right. The Shop Admirable Devil was the name of it. And uh, it was uh, with some wonderful partners who I met at a public affairs firm here in Washington, D.C. called GM&B. We got together and decided that we wanted to hang out a shingle uh, and see what kind of work we could do. And uh, naturally, you know, for me, it, it was like we had to be purpose driven. Right. We, mm -hmm. we had to do work that was going to make a difference. So we worked with some great clients in the outdoor uh, recreation space and, and fishing and in conservation. So Bonefish and Tarpon Trust was a, was an early client of ours, uh, doing great work conserving, um, uh, again, large marine areas actually for uh, for Bonefish Permanent and, and, and Tarpon. And of course, all the other species that go along um, with those big um, sort of key megafauna. And then uh, on the rec side, uh, we worked with Orvis, uh, and a few other really interesting fishing brands, and then a number of corporate brands. You know, you know some of the traditional, traditional ones. Uh, that was great. You know, it was a great run. Um, we did a lot of meaningful work. And again, you know, I have that background in corporate communications. And what we were working on fundamentally was large advertising campaigns, big right. public campaigns, um, some influencer campaigns. Uh, after you know, unfortunately, we hit this little thing called the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> It slowed business down, and we had to all reevaluate what you know what was the opportunities ahead of us. And um, eventually, we, we we moved into another area, and I and we we shut shut the shop down. 
Um, lucky for me, I uh, heard about a little organization called the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation and had a chance to go work with them for a couple of years on global policies. And it was there, I was very fortunate to be introduced um, to E.O. Wilson, um, one of our great conservation minds, um, great scientists in America, and to develop a, a, a good friendship with him. And mm -hmm. he became kind of a mentor in his last few years. And I was very fortunate to be able to work with him to tell um, not only his story, but this, his to carry his last message. And, and you know, he passed away um, uh, at the age of 93 while we were working together. And I got to record and pr produce his final uh his final presentations um as it were and you know his messages really inspired the large scale land planning land conservation movement um around a theory called half earth uh huh you know we basically set aside enough land and enough sea to protect global biodiversity the seed of that idea really led to the big international movements we now know as 30 by 30, right? Right. So moving from half to 30, um, setting aside 30% uh, percent of land and seas by 2030. And then here in the United States, uh, elements of that, you know, those have come together, woven together to inform and inspire uh, the uh, President Biden's America the Beautiful Initiative, which, which is now, you know, somewhat wider and broader but incorporates, you know, addressing climate change and and readiness and uh, ad adaptation and resilience. And so, uh, after my time at the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation, I had this wonderful opportunity to join uh, the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, and I'm I'm delighted to be here because as now, are we, as are we, Joel. Well, it's wonderful. I get to take that high level global policy work the communications work, and now bring it all to bear on our nation's 15 national marine sanctuaries and two national monuments that that we uh, help support uh, in our partnership with NOAA. And um, for those who don't really have you know that much knowledge about our marine sanctuaries, okay. they're actually far more dynamic, amazing systems. Back uh, 50 years ago now, I think we just celebrated the 50th anniversary, the National Marine Sanctuaries Act was put in place to protect our nation's ecological and maritime wonders, right? So the very first sanctuary was actually built around the USS Monitor. Uh, if you remember the old um, uh, ironclad ships in the Civil War. So they discovered that 50 something years ago and said, we need to protect this. And that was the justice for the Marine Sanctuaries Act. But naturally, at that same time, you've got, you know, the middle 70s or so. You know, you've got the conservation movement growing and it naturally, you know, extended from preservation into conservation. Right. The Sanctuaries Act is actually not only there to uh, protect that America's maritime heritage, but also to protect the ecological heritage. Right. So our sure. deep sea coral reefs, you know, the coral reefs in the, in the Florida Keys, uh, the kelp forests along the California and Oregon coasts. You know, I could go on and on, but around our nation's waters are just unbelievable uh, 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 habitats and ecosystems that are protected in, in these sort of 15 sanctuaries, um, which is a wonderful uh, system and and not well known, not not known well enough. Mm -hmm. so one of my one of my goals, of course, is to help America learn more about and value those, those those sanctuaries. And so now let's see uh, it is about, 60 70 days in on the on the job uh, i am uh loving every really? minute. It's, uh, it's only 60 to not, 70 days wow yeah, I, I, started, I, I, I feels started, like you've been here for a long time well you know i mean i certainly around the space um right. you know the, the the cold water conservation space that i had worked in has a lot of you know intersections um down at uh you know at the coast and beyond for so, sure. uh, and it's really, honestly, it's one big system and it's one big community. So, um, where were you born? I was born in New Hampshire. Um, really? Was, Whereabouts? I didn't know that. How did yeah, I know, I know that? Yeah, I know, right? Uh, I was born in Concord, New Hampshire. Yeah. Uh, my 
father was in law school there at Franklin Pierce and my family were all, you know, we were, we, we sort of wound up there. He actually, he was a Vietnam vet, came back um, uh-huh. at my mother at Michigan state and then on the GI bill was there and then went to law school there in Franklin Pierce. And actually he didn't finish law school. Too many kids, too yeah. many kids, got a bunch of siblings. Uh, but he did become a uh, an investigator for um, the state on uh, civil rights. Oh, interesting! Uh, and it was a it was a really compelling. My 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 father was a civil rights activist and and investigator and and an educator, you know, for most of his career. In New um, Hampshire. Uh, well, we we moved on from New Hampshire to uh, Cleveland, uh, oh, Cleveland, okay. right there on the the banks of Lake Erie, and that was a fascinating shift going from you know rural you know i always sort of consider myself a yankee you know right well, well no I did the... northern woods to the midwest yep in a city that was in the 80s really you know going through some very very tough times and For sure. but also coming out of a certain you know beginning to recover and that started of course there on the cuyahoga river and lake erie you know if you think about um the important you know laws that were put into place to protect our water mm-hmm. they were beginning to have an Clean impact act, in yeah. places like 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 Lake Erie and uh it was a fascinating place to grow up in you know it was both urban but also had these incredible parks the metro park system mm-hmm. that allowed me and my siblings to roam wild and play in the parks and have our own adventures and sort of connect with nature um, and then, you know, the other thing about Lake Erie, so my father was a fisherman um, right. and his, he learned it from from his mother. My grandmother was a fisherman and it goes back generations, actually. Um, in fact, it goes back all the way back to uh, my ancestors living on the eastern shore of Maryland who were um, uh, commercial uh, fishermen watermen. Uh, and watermen coming out of the uh, coming out of uh, um, after the Civil War when they were green. And so anyway, my, my father was a fisherman and it was a tough life in Cleveland. And in fact, we were oftentimes um, food insecure, um, Mm -hmm. frankly, and my father was a fisherman. So he, he would go out and we would fish for walleye and all sorts of incredible um, fish. And we would eat, you know, that's how we survived, you know, the occasional duck. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, but it was a big deal. And so I looked at Lake Erie really as a, not as only as a source of release and escape from the urban pressures of that city and a playground, both imaginative and fun and full of wonder, but also as a place that sustained my family. And then after that, I moved to um, Ocean City, New Jersey. So we kind of went from my, my where my mother's family was from to where my father's family was. Gotcha. And then I got to see the ocean, I think, for the first time in my life in high school, uh, ninth grader. And uh, absolutely fell in love with it. I lived in Ocean City, which is a town that's sort of three miles long, um, half a mile wide, you know, basically. And yeah. um, they are south of Atlantic City. And, you know, waking up with the gulls and crying, you know, and screaming around you and dealing with, you know, the occasional, you know, flood tide, you know, king tide and, and yeah. flood in, the, in the city and you know, crabbing on the bay. It was a wonderful way to finish my high school years before I went off to college. So, awesome. well, yeah. I, I'm going to tie this back, even though right. I took us off track to New Hampshire, because that's where I was born and raised. And, um, but this, the, the, the foundation does when it, even though it's national or it's the um, national Marine Marine sanctuary that you actually have, you do work in the great lakes. That's exactly right. That's how I tied in Lake Erie. See, I did (laughs) Good job. So, yeah. So the 15 um, plus marine sanctuaries include sanctuaries in in the Great Lakes. And and that's something also that's not as well known. But, of course, if you've you've grown up on the Great Lakes, you might be more familiar with it. So one of the most popular ones, of course, is is Thunder Bay. Um, Thunder Bay up in the northern peninsula of Michigan is absolutely just stunning, beautiful country. But around the town of Alpena, where this Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary uh, was both you know, nominated and designated some 20 plus years ago, Alpena had been suffering from like many of the sort of you know, Rust Belt towns from 
you know, businesses closing, uh, jobs moving offshore, and Alpina was in real trouble. Their paper mill shut down right around the same time the idea for this sanctuary emerged. And the idea for the sanctuary was to protect this treasure trove of, of, of shipwrecks uh, there in, the, uh, I believe, Lake Huron um, that now I think we we know there's somewhere around 400 shipwrecks in that sanctuary. Wow. And the amazing thing about that part of the lake is that, you know, in the summer when it's warm and it's, uh, the water is crystal clear, some of these shipwrecks you can literally see from shore. Uh-huh them out to you know if you wanted to or kayak out to and 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 literally be right over them and then others you know you kind of have to take a, a a boat but um that sanctuary i was just there this summer and heard from the various leaders of that town as well as the superintendent jeff gray and that sanctuary the message i heard over and over again that sanctuary saved that town really so partly when we talk about sanctuaries we really have to think of them as as places that are, you know, their their nexuses, their connections between both that maritime history, that maritime cultural history, the species, the biodiversity, but also the people and the communities on the coasts that support and work to protect these places. And now the town has a sanctuary movie theater. That's what the title really? is. Yeah, it has tens of thousands of visitors every summer who come through there for fishing, for kayaking, to see the, sh the shipwrecks, um, for boating and all kinds of other um, um, activities, including educational activities there at the at the Discovery Center. There's a visitor center. And NOAA has facilities there as, as well. So, uh -huh. you know, they're complex places, but they allow us to connect, you know, fundamentally um, with these incredible natural resources that are all around the country. So one more last one, just to tie it back to fly fishing. Um, in something I read, do you have fly fished on fifty rivers? Is that your true or? Or <laughs> so was it? Was it you wanted to fish in all fifty states? Give me just, just yeah. A so for for everybody who's listening and with the fly fishing thing, it so goes back to Tom and I's uh, passion for fly fishing. We're both rabid rabid fly anglers and you know and that frankly that's what got me into working at trout unlimited though i though i knew i wanted to shift my career to conservation um that that passionate pursuit and and in that time actually at tu it was something around the level of like 30 different rivers it was it was uh -huh. a blessing to be able to travel and meet with all the volunteers who really make up the chapters and the networks of people that are protecting these waters these in these these fisheries across the country and yeah, okay, you could try to have a meeting in a you know a, a boardroom at Sheraton, but the guys are leaning over and their their feet are tapping and they're antsy and they're like, when are we going out on the water? Right. So right, you know right. we would just go. You know that was where we did most of our work. We would go fish and talk, um, and and discuss you know the projects like that that needed to happen to to protect those those trout and salmon. Are you going to carry some of that sort of? Um... Uh, I don't know, ethos to to the sanctuaries, go visit all your sanctuaries? Well, in many ways, I mean, that ethos is already there, right? So right. these sanctuaries, like I said, they're, 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 they are, they're, they're lively, they're dynamic, they're where things happen. So there are places where people are fishing and have right. been fishing for, in some cases, thousands of years. If you think about some of the, some of the Native American and also the the tribal nations and indigenous peoples that also um, are stewards of some of these sanctuaries and some of these waters. But um, there are fishermen, there are recreational fishermen, there's commercial fishermen in some of these sanctuaries, um, diving, scuba diving, snorkeling, surfing, um, kayaking, sailing, you know, you name it. If it's got, you know, all of our passionate pursuits around the water are all available in the sanctuaries. And so Naturally, of course, I'm going to try to bring a fly rod with me <laughs> when well, I of course when I visit these sites. Uh, I kind of regretting the one thing I didn't do. I went to Thunder Bay because I didn't bring a fly rod with me on that trip. And I, of course, I'm walking along the river and I look down. That's next to the Discovery Center, and boom, there's a big old smallie just yeah. sitting there waiting for a popper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? And I was like, oh, I won't make that mistake again. <laughs> there you go. There yeah. you go. Um. So, um. Do you have you have you come up come upon a favorite sanctuary yet? 
Well, I've been in three so far. Okay. Uh, excuse me, four. Um, so the Potomac, River Mallows Bay Sanctuary here, which is, you know, I, I live in Maryland. It's about an hour away in Nansamon, Maryland, um, south here of, of Washington, D.C. It's an incredible, very accessible sanctuary mm -hmm. uh, with a, a next to a nature conservancy reserve and it has uh -huh. an Audubon partnership there, uh, a chapter. So kids go in and out of there all the time. I really love that one because there are a number of shipwrecks there that are just below the surface of the water. And de depending on the tide, you know, you can float right over them with your, your kayak and experience them. And they're beautiful, you know, amazing uh, wrecks with their own history. And then it's a beautiful biodiverse area, you know, green herons and cranes and bald eagles and osprey. And then if you're a fisherman, largemouth bass and smallmouth bass, turtles everywhere. It's a wonderful place to discover. The and what's the name of that one again? That is Potomac Mallows Bay. Um, and it used to be Mallows Bay, I believe, used to be a state a state park, and then it, it became a sanctuary. It's so, on the Maryland side of Virginia, of of the uh, just up river of the bridge, right? Of the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. Uh, I don't Woodrow know Wilson, probably no. that bridge. Yes, yeah, so yeah. but it's on the Maryland side. Yeah, yeah, and it's I very careful, I... very close to the city. And in fact, actually, one of the things I wanted to mention was that um, the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. Like, what do we do, right? Right. In terms of how we can support that. Well. Um, we help to create uh, both funds, strategic funds to help build facilities and staff workers and bring young people and all sorts of people to these places to learn about them. And in fact, recently there was a, um, a major um, announcement uh, that came out of the, the IRA funds for uh, dollars to help support facilities. And there at Malice Bay, um, they're going to be receiving several million dollars to build a visitor center. So we're very excited about that. Um, that will wow. be happening in the next few years. And overall, the $50 million from the IRA is going to be spent on um, more than half a dozen uh, visitor centers uh, around the sanctuary system. System, yeah. So that's pretty exciting. And, you know, we had a, a, a we play a role in helping to drive appropriations and attention and advocacy for those kinds of investments uh, made by the government in back into our sanctuary system. Um, and, and it's really critical because they sit at NOAA and you know NOAA has a lot of responsibilities as you can imagine, including the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, which for right. many years has been um, managing these sites. But like any part of government, pick, your, pick one, they need resources. You know, right, right. They, and we play a role at the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation in helping to both drive the resources of uh, philanthropy, you know, philanthropies and other types of organizations, institutional funders, and the public into um, our National Marine Sanctuaries. And we also do our own, our own, our own fundraising for the sanctuaries right. as well on special projects. First of all, um, I want to acknowledge that the naming process of some of our marine sanctuaries um have historically left out you know the the peoples around which these sanctuaries um are are part of their community right so right. including papahanaumokuakea okay. uh national marine uh, monument well done. um is a uh a, an amazing sanctuary that is managed between the state of hawaii Noah naturally, um, and a, a group of indigenous Hawaiians. Mm -hmm. okay? And it's a incredible um, uh, collaboration, if you will, uh, and how this incredible biodiverse and biocultural site um, is protected. And that's one of the sanctuaries, in fact, that maybe has some of the most strict uh, regulations and protections mm -hmm on it because the environment um is 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 so um is one it's so delicate but also right. so pristine but also and this is really critical has so much cultural value and um you know that's part of the national marine sanctuary foundation's job is to help the american public understand you know the different life ways and the different ways in which these sanctuaries play a role within the lives of their communities. So that one is a, an interesting one. Um, 
in fact, what's what uh, is exciting about um, that monument and others uh, and other sanctuaries in the Pacific remote islands is that the Biden Harris administration uh, last year, um, well, actually not last year, this year, uh, basically has um, come out in and in, in support of creating the largest marine protected area in the world. Right. That would actually incorporate uh, multiple multiple sanctuaries and monuments and pull them together into a larger resource. Um, and you know that's part of achieving these larger goals, the uh, like America the Beautiful, um, and recognizing the need to set aside more of more more ocean and sea for protection. Well, I, and I think you were touching on an area that I think ties back to something you said earlier, which was, you know, getting the word out to the American people. I mean, obviously, somebody with your background as a storyteller or communicator, um, as one of those myself, obviously, I'm excited to see you in a leadership role and what I consider one of the more important aspects of of, um, marine conservation. Um, But and and I think at least in my case, before I took on this role, um, I would have, if if somebody had said marine sanctuaries, I would have been thinking in the technical scientific Mm. um, world, as opposed to some of the other focus areas that that the Sanctuary Foundation, and I'd love to have you touch on them. But one of them was you know the 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 recreation but let's 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 stick on this cultural and marine heritage one for a second because earlier on we had a, a, a in a previous chat i had um um marissa mcculliff and lauren divine from the tribal governments of uh, st paul island and i'm not even going to attempt to say the name of this in of the potential uh sanctuary that they're talking about but it's referred to as heart of the ocean like pop like 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 um papa so um but it is it was that's what really tuned me into the cultural part of that and um so if you can talk a little bit about what your vision is with the foundation in that area that's that I think that's great uh question. Thank you for that one, Tom, because it is uh something that is really central to the way in which we need to um think about how we take on some of these big less and less existential and more real problems of climate mm-hmm. change, biodiversity loss, and also systemic inequity. Those those sort of are the three big ones I think of. And Part of that is incorporating, not incorporating, but making sure from the very beginning that as we go down this path of creating large scale um, uh, protected areas, in particular Mm -hmm. marine protected areas, working with the communities uh, to understand what their needs are, right? And what their cultural relationship is to those sites, um, which in some cases are sacred you mm-hmm. know, as well as their ongoing practices, the both the traditional ecological knowledge that we talk often about, but also just their regular life ways, you know, how they how they sustain themselves off of those resources. And we together um, have, I think, a responsibility through the through our national marine sanctuaries, based on the way it actually works, the way in which we create sanctuaries, to ensure that those voices, are heard and respected and those insights that they bring to the table are driving the way that those resources will be managed in the future. So um, what is absolutely powerful and drew me to this opportunity to take on this leadership role was the fact that our sanctuaries for the most part are really nominated from the community. Mm -hmm. They're brought up from the communities where these sanctuaries are. I don't think a lot of people understand that. Right. They're 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 essentially nominated and then they go through a complex process with NOAA where there's a series of reviews and then 
they are accepted into a inventory, if you will, right. and then moved along in a path through further review. And then ultimately they might be designated. And sometimes they might not because they maybe don't read, they don't meet a very particular set, set of guidelines. But at the core is frankly, I think very, very democratic principles, you know, uh, about the way in which we protect our marine areas. The, uh, of course, you know, the, the, the perhaps one of the most well known efforts in this area at this stage is the Shumash, Nash, uh, Shumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. And that was nominated by the Nor Northern Tribal uh, Shumash uh, Council. And what's interesting about that nomination is the first tribal nomination. Right. So what you've got is um, a community, you know, basically elevating an area on the California coast, uh, sort of north of the Channel Islands and the Channel Island Islands Marine National Sanctuary, south of Monterey Bay, saying this area to us is important, right? And it has been for hundreds of, of years, if not thousands of years, for the various communities that are there. And there are numerous communities that have been on that on, uh, in that area for a long time. But this particular group that worked to bring attention to it and nominate it and bring it forward in partnership with NOAA and other and other folks on the ground, at the core of it is this notion that it is a tribal nomination. So therefore, as we go out towards management and future management of this of this sanctuary, the expectation then is that there will be some level of uh, input and management uh, guidance from from those from those communities, including the original nominator. So it is it is a really powerful notion. Um, yes, you know we still are um supportive of, of of things like the antiquities act which of course can designate through you know the president's right, right. Powers, you know a national marine monument or even through you know an executive order asking you know NOAA or some other party to, you know well frankly NOAA to look into um you know um identifying new areas and sanctuaries but at its core this is the power of the National Marine Sanctuary System. It is really, and I think of it as, it is America's system, right, of marine sanctuaries, and it can be elevated by Americans. It's a powerful tool. You know? So, so let's talk a little bit about. So that's that alludes to references a lot of public input. Where do you guys come into in the process? Well, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. And in terms of the foundation, so we are involved at different parts of that process. So right. we spend most of our time, I want to be clear, with our existing, you know, 15 sure. plus national marine sanctuaries and monuments. And that's a that's more than enough work. But the designation process is one where we play a role in helping to elevate um, that nomination. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot that first of all, it's an all volunteer for the nominator. It's an all volunteer force. Mm -hmm. No one's getting paid, you know, and many times it is multi, it's absolutely a multi-year and in some cases a multi-generational effort. So we play a role in helping to support that process and it can include, you know, uh, education and outreach, training, advocacy, how to how to communicate and, and work with uh, our, NOAA and other state and local regu uh, regulator, uh, regulators, as well as uh, um, helping to spread uh, attention to mm -hmm. the value of that nomination and what it means. But also we play a convening role. So there are many constituencies and stakeholders. Uh, there's also rights holders in, involved right. in this scenario. And, and you know, creating the opportunity for all of them to come to the table is not easy. But it's something that we work, we strive for every, every day. And right now, Shumash is in halfway through its public comment period, and it's knock on wood, it's our, it's the final public comment period. Although that right. could always change. And um, I think we're, it's a sixty day comment period. It'll end on October twenty fifth. And what I would do is, if you have a an opinion or a comment to make, that comment is open to all Americans. Everyone can 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 submit a perspective or a view. On uh, and get to know uh, 
the value of, of, of this particular sanctuary and what it means, share that because that those comments are critical. They're critical to helping uh, Noah understand how the public feels about this resource. It helps them to make decisions and to advocate for certain for certain things and to make choices. Right now, there are several um, uh, plans, potential plans that Noah has put forth mm -hmm. about the boundaries um, of the of the sanctuary, uh, and and frankly, also some early ideas, though they're not set in stone. That's why we have a common period. Some, but some early ideas about how to manage the 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 the, the system. Uh, so the sanctuary. So it's it's critical to have public input. Um, so and so yeah. do you, you guys actually elevate that opportunity for people to. Um, to learn about the public comment opportunity. Is that's that right. Fair? And we do, that's right. And we don't do it alone. I mean, there's a whole host of um, fantastic conservation organizations, civic organizations, governmental organizations that are part of that process. If, you know, we sort of sit uh, sometimes at the center of ensuring some of those, some coordination there. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it's a- Well, it's somebody's a, got to herd the cats. It's a community effort. I mean, well, yeah, there's great partners. Like you, you've got the National Ocean Protection Coalition. I mean, that they're a wonderful group of, um, I believe, over 35 now and maybe past 40 organizations mm -hmm. um, that uh, have a stake in the success of this nomination. And so we're not alone. There's hardly alone. There's there's many folks there on the ground doing it. And, and you know, they come in at different phases too because sure. they have their own constituents and their constituents... You know, find different ways to connect with the with that sanctuary. Um, let's let's step back for a second to to the an area that you and I are particular, or I'm at least particularly interested. You come from that background, um, tourism and recreation. Again, when I was saying earlier that most of us, when we thought, and when I first got exposed five years ago to this to the Sanctuary Foundation and the Sanctuary process at NOAA. You know, again, I kind of thought of it as a, it's a scientific deal. And, mm. um, you know, there were there were folks um, over at the foundation who um, helped me understand, and the foundation had a, a focus on explaining the recreational opportunities within the, the, the sanctuaries. Um, so, Elaborate on a little bit about that. You you you've got uh, the Blue Beacon Initiative. Is that did I? Well, that? yes. And so that so on on recreation. So first of all, there's a lot. There are you're right. There are a lot of different activities. There's there's scientific research, there's right. restoration and habitat restoration. There's public engagement and outreach, and naturally there's recreation. Um, the but Blue Beacon actually is not exactly um, around recreation, though it is. It's a platform for us to. Uh, to elevate all of those different aspects that take place in the sanctuaries. So we we have recently done a Blue Beacon, which is a, okay. uh, it's either an in-person meeting or a webinar. And we've recently done one on recreation uh, there in the Florida Keys. And, uh, you know, it's funny, when I was explaining to friends and family what this new role is and this opportunity, I would talk about the sanctuaries and most of them would just, what what is that? And I yeah, would say, yeah. I say, well, have you been to the Florida Keys? Yeah, of course. You know, have, did you go swimming? Yes. Did you go snorkeling, diving? Did you go fishing? Yes. So well, you were in, you know, the the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, and that area was protected. And I would go on to explain why. You know, I would talk about, for mm -hmm. example, buoys that are there. So if you're a boater, um, you can't just drop your anchor in the Florida Keys National Marine right. Sanctuary. You have to connect to one of these buoys. Um, and anchor up there, right? Now, why? You know, one, you're going to have a great time. There were plenty of these buoys. They want you to be out there and explore um, the, the sanctuary and have fun. But two, they don't want you to drop the anchor on corals, right? right. Those beautiful corals that you're snorkeling over are delicate and they're sensitive. Um, they don't want those to be destroyed. And that's naturally a way that the, the recreation can have an impact on that, 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 that ecosystem, and so there's a balance between the education of the public there, as well as the uh, as well as the recreational activities that you want to pursue. But it's different in every sanctuary, because each one is a, it's its own system with its own unique habitat, 
and even though some of them are connected and they have they're connected through species and uh it is in, in one sense it is one great ocean um, sure. they're certainly connected in terms of environmental impacts you know they each one offers their own unique fun kind of aspects depending on what you want to do i from myself i am learning how to scuba dive excellent really, really looking forward to um diving in a few places i want to dive in monterey bay i was just there recently on a visit and uh saw these divers walking down the shore right in town um going right out of the you know right out of the park off of cannery row to dive in the same waters where if you look just a little further you could see sea otters you know and a little bit further beyond that a whale or two and it's like all of that is within a couple of miles of the beach because of that unique ecosystem and and the diversity, the biodiversity there of, of those waters. I was like, that's a reason to get me out and get and get me to learn how to dive. So I'm looking forward to that. Well, I encourage it. I, I learned to dive 40 years ago and it's um it's 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 an experience that um is 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 hard to describe because all of a sudden you're you're sort of isolated, but you're isolated in this huge, vast system. It's almost like flying. And it's, um, I think you'll love it. Uh, it is, um, it connects to the fishing world pretty quickly. And you, you'll see the connection. And it's, um, I, 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 I've, I've always, when, when Grace first mentioned the recreational opportunities of course i went to diving scuba diving and then um you know it's it is uh very fortunate that that those kind of recreational opportunities seem to to help educate the the the, the public and and it's you'll remember this from from my days on the after board when we talked about recreational opportunity i mean uh access to healthy habitat created right. recreational opportunity um and um it's it is again from the fly fishing world we know you teach somebody how to fly fish you turn them into a conservationist right yes and and i think it's it's listen it's the same if you love to surf if you love to fish you know it's the opportunity is there mm -hmm. And there are fortunately, in this broad sort of ocean community, there are a lot of different organizations that are going to try to tap into that opportunity and get you to go that next step. You know, I mentioned earlier Mallows Bay on the Potomac River and that sanctuary. And recently we we did a fishing clinic there with 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 youth and um, in partnership with uh, the, the National Park. Uh, oh, I'm going to butcher it. National Park Trust. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and conservation trust, um, and it was they they do wonderful work, and they've been doing a lot of the same work in our national parks, and now they're interested in doing it in some of our more accessible sanctuaries. Excellent. So we did a, an, you know, they brought the fishing rods, they brought the vans, they brought the kids, you know, and these young people, many of them have never fished before, but they're making their first connections, and it they don't see you know a border <laughs> they don't see dotted lines on a map around this site they see the river they see the beach they see the animals you know it's one system for them right and that wonder that 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 experience of connection that's the opportunity then that we have as an organization all of us really to make a conservationist to make someone aware that this resource is threatened you know, no matter what, you know, we talk about climate change, you know, just to give you a quick example and to bring it back to Florida. On my first day on the job, it was the hottest day on planet Earth. In my first week on the job, it was the hottest week on planet Earth. My yeah. first month on the job, it was the hottest month on planet Earth. And at the same time, I was getting these notes, these messages, check in on the Florida Keys, check in on the Keys. And I, and I look it up and sure enough, the water had become hotter than a hot tub in the Florida Keys. Yeah. Our program in partnership or a program in partnership with NOAA down there that we're supportive of, Mission Iconic Reefs, protects seven iconic reefs all throughout the Florida Keys. And, you know, I'm seeing social media posts about from, from divers and conservationists and local community members. And fishermen. And colors 
and fisheries basically showing the damage as some of these corals are beginning to bleach and die. Now, fortunately, there's a robust, powerful coral community down there mm -hmm. that jumped into action and they started doing projects to remove and and save pieces of coral so that they can potentially restore it later. And they were coral banking them in nurseries, either in deeper water or on wow. land. Um, and banking. It's incredible, right? But at the same time, that heat wave persisted for, for, for weeks. And um, the impacts of this are directly di related to climate change. And just a few years ago, we saw a marine heat wave on the, the California coast devastate kelp forests. Right. And so, you know, you look at it and you say, well, I, you know, I've dived these areas, I've fished these areas, or I've grown up, grown up in these waters. You know, my family has grown up in these waters. And you start to see the resource dwindle. It's the old adage of, you know, yo, you should have seen it 20 years ago. Well, we're having that like every other day. In fact, NOAA has recent research that says the amount of uh, days between billion dollar disasters from hurricanes to, you, you know, marine heat waves has shrunk to just, you know, uh, I think 18 days, the, the, the space. So every 18 days we get a billion disaster billion dollar disaster so that's where we are and it's 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 we have um it's 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 funny i think of like recreation and access and i know about its its deep importance to the work we do but i always think about it as it's the front door to a whole house where you have lots of other things that you can learn and experience um and connect with so that's a great way to put it the front door to to a, to a big house yeah that's awesome yeah, yeah. that's awesome Joel, I'm cognizant of your time. So we've got 10 minutes before the end of the half to, for the bottom of the hour. Um, is there er, things you want to talk about the the foundation that we didn't touch on real quick? Well, well, sure. Yeah. I mean, there's I listen, this I could talk forever about the, <laughs> about this sure. series. There's there's so many interesting things happening. I think for, you know, first and foremost, you know, what I'm looking forward to doing. Uh, in my my new role as the president and CEO of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, is is helping America understand and value these incredible resources. You know, these are not underwater parks. These are not right. museum pieces. You know, these are sources of solutions. That's what sanctuaries really are. The kind of scientific research and restoration that we're doing it models opportunities that the whole world could eventually take advantage of we're doing the kind of research right now that could lead to innovation in for example fishing gear that could mm -hmm. transform fisheries around the world you know and i like to think of these places as living laboratories okay you know? that's good uh, when i was in thunder bay they uh hearing from um the superintendent there jeff gray there was a picture that got put up and it was a picture of one of the, the shipwrecks at the bottom of that lake and you know it's beautiful light filtering down through 200 feet of water to this shipwreck and it's so crystal clear you can see this 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 you know 100 year old ship anyway you can the picture shows that it's you can almost read the plaque of the name of the ship that's the before. The after, it's encrusted every square inch of the ship with invasive zebra mussels, you know? And that's, wow. I mean, you know, that is the story of the threat. And if you, if, if, if it's not the marine heat wave and the idea that the waters in the Florida Keys reach the level of a hot tub, right. then it's got to be that the ship that is part of our maritime history has been you know, completely is being completely transformed because of the invasive species, which are in, in turn being their 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 impacts are being accelerated by climate change. Right. So, you know, these existential threats of climate change and biodiversity loss, the loss of species, you know, the systemic inequities that we face in terms of the the divide that's happening here in America between peoples and groups. Our sanctuaries are sites where we can bring people together and find solutions. 
And I think um, I think that that's going to be important to Americans to know that, you know, there are places that we all collectively care about, um, that we want to see um, survive those threats. And I think folks are going to come together. We just have to help them understand it. And we have to help them know, learn about it. We, well, we really think, need to increase the awareness of our marine, of our national marine sanctuaries. Well, so. I, I think I think that is tremendous work. Obviously, it's important work to do. Uh, I commend you for doing it. Um, we at the network obviously um, see you as a partner and and someone where we'd love to help get your get the message out. Um, Tell us, tell me, um, if people want more information, do we, do you have a newsletter, social right. media, do you have, what are the. Actually, you, so there are social media sites for, uh, on, you know, on, from LinkedIn to yep. uh, Twitter to Facebook, you can find uh, the National Marine Sanctuaries. Um, and there are some sites specifically for the National Marine Sanctuaries. So if you have one in your neck of the woods that you're, that you, you know, you can find it and then follow it. You can also go to uh, marinesanctuary.org, which is our website, and that will provide you a great base to learn more about the sanctuaries. Sign up for, our, yes, naturally, our newsletter and our emails, and we'll keep you up to date on all the changes that are going on, as well as the exciting news around these potential uh, new designations of, of sanctuaries. And then also, of course, naturally, you can connect to all the social media at the bottom of the page. So we'd love to have folks um, join and learn more about uh, the, the the Sanctuary Foundation, uh, as well as the work that we do, and and then that way we can keep in touch with you about all the interesting news. And can they donate? Of course they can donate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I think it's fundraising you know, background. Absolutely. I mean, if you feel so inclined, right? Yes, I yeah. think that's the thing I always sort of say. I, I feel like, you know. It, it's really important to to recognize that um, these are um, these are America's public waters. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talk a lot about public lands, but we sometimes forget the public waters. It's a part. great point. These are America's public waters, right? I mean, the ability to enjoy the Florida Keys the way you can, or Monterey Bay, or out on Stellwagen and in, in the, the near just past the uh, Massachusetts Bay and and watching the incredible species like the North Atlantic white ray. Uh, right whale easy for you um, to say yeah easy for me to say you know all of that uh work that we do and the work of scientists and researchers you know obviously it all takes resources and um uh, i encourage people to think about how they can be a part of their sanctuaries by helping to support it i just realized i meant to wear my hope my marine sanctuaries foundation Hawaiian shirt and I screwed up and completely <laughs> forgot to do that. Well, now we got to record the whole thing over yeah, again. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> and I'm going to have Colin fix it in post production, green screen my shirt back on. No, but I mean, that was one of the things that um, when there was that promotion to get that, I immediately jumped on it. So, partnership with uh, uh, Rain Spooner. Exactly. Um, out of Hawaii, a wonderful. Yeah. Um, a wonderful Hawaiian shirt company. I can't um, believe I screwed up on that. Oh, oh, that's right. that's, I, oh. You know what? I should have worn mine. So like I said, yeah. we'll, we'll just have to come back. We're going to do it again. Follow-up conversation and we'll both wear ours. So. Exactly. And, and, and um, qu quickly, um, ciao. Ciao. Okay. So for, for, for folks listening and watching, ciao is Capitol Hill Ocean Week. And it basically coincides with ocean week every year and that's something you guys run we run capitol hill ocean week we bring people from all over the country actually from all over the world frankly here into washington dc to meet with um their representatives uh as well as to connect and convene with each other over the course of two days we have um a free conference mm -hmm. and there are probably eight hours each day of panels with the leading voices in ocean justice, which is uh, an area we need to do more work in, mm -hmm. climate change, biodiversity loss, um, uh, maritime history and culture and per cultural preservation. And uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for everyone to connect, network, and build capacity together. And that's really what our, what our goal is for Chow. 
Uh, and then also we honor uh, later on in the evening uh, the, those folks who are from, uh, you know, Congress and other areas who are leading on doing this kind of important marine protection uh, work. And um, it gives us, again, it gives an opportunity for everyone to come together and celebrate our national marine sanctuaries. And it's in June, right? It's in June. That's okay. right. Yeah. Well, then maybe we'll bookmark to either do a follow-up before next year's chow or just after next year's oh, chow, or maybe yeah. we'll do it at chow. I say let's do it at chow. I mean, let's do it at chow. Incredible and we, people there. Yeah. And we can wear our shirts. And That's right. And hopefully, knock on wood, we are celebrating the designation of not one, but maybe two new national sanctuaries. Well, well, then, then, then it would be definitely high celebration that time. That right. time, Joel. Thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time, sharing your knowledge, sharing your experience, um, and sharing your vision for for the sanctuary, and telling us or helping us understand what the foundation does. So I really appreciate it. As I said, well, looking forward to doing this again. Thank you very much, Tom. And if I could just share one last sort of absolutely. So, as I said earlier, the climate—you know—we're uh, now in a climate disaster mode, and we are all trying to respond to multiple emergencies. And it—it it goes without saying that we see more of these emergencies every day. And I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that the the devastating fires in Lahaina. Uh huh. Uh, obviously, um, the people of uh, Maui uh, and the great state of Hawaii, you know, are, are suffering um, and suffered a lot, and including some of the community there um, who really helped to support in its earliest stages the Hawaiian Islands Humpback uh, National Marine Sanctuary. And um, our hearts go out to them, and we For encourage sure. them to support and help that community in any way they can no oh, that's that's terrific a terrific reminder of how this what's changing so fast can be so devastating so quickly so that's right that's right thank you my good friend i i if we get water down here i will have you come down and while we won't have a marine sanctuary i will show you some native brook trout that would make you smile from ear to ear that's um, wonderful so it'd be great. Uh, do, are there any questions that you want me to, 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 to answer from her? Or we were all covered. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't get any in the chat. So I think we're, we, we've skated by that one and uh, we'll just, <laughs> we'll just wrap up. <laughs> all right. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Tom, for having me. I really appreciate Thank it. you, Joel. If you enjoyed this episode of Waterside Chat, share it with your friends and colleagues. You can check us out on YouTube or most podcast services. To stay up to date on Waterside Chats and the Marine Fish Conservation Network, sign up for emails at conservefish.org. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you at the next Waterside Chat.